Hello dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Rimal Preet Kaur, Assistant Professor, Khalsa College of Education, Ranjit Avenue, Amritsar. Today we are going to discuss about decentralization, local management and governance in education. After studying this topic, you will be able to know the meaning of decentralization in education, understand the constitutional obligations of local self-government institutions in India, realize the importance of decentralization in school governance, describe the role of stakeholders in local management and governance in education, understand the ways to improve education by local management and governance. Explain the advantages and challenges of local governance in education. Students, as we know that policy makers, educators and others involved in education are seeking ways to utilize limited resources efficiently and effectively in order to identify and solve problems in the education sector and to provide quality education for children. Their efforts have contributed to realize the significance and benefits of community participation in education and have recognized community participation as one of the strategies to improve educational access and quality. Therefore, decentralization or dividing the responsibilities among people plays an important role in school governance. In technical words, we can define decentralization as transfer of decision-making authority closer to the consumer or beneficiary. There are mainly three ways of decentralizing powers, namely deconcentration, delegation and devolution, where the word deconcentration refers to transfer of administrative functions through the relocation of central administrative bodies to different geographical areas. A popular form of deconcentration in education is to give additional responsibilities to schools. This is often called school autonomy or school-based management and may take the form of creating elected or appointed school councils and giving budgets and authority to make important educational decisions. Deconcentration may also take the form of empowering school directors and teaching faculty to make decisions within the school. The word delegation is the transfer of managerial and regulatory functions to other bodies and agencies which may be local, regional or national such as quasi-autonomous non-governmental organizations. And the third is devolution. That is, the transfer of powers, rights, assets and local resources to a local government, communities or lower central government. Most often, education responsibilities are transferred to general purpose governments at the regional or local levels. In rare cases, additional responsibilities are given to single purpose governments such as local schools. When education responsibilities are transferred to general purpose governments, the elected governing bodies of those governments must make decisions about how much to spend on education versus other local services. Decentralization moves decision-making body closer to the people and may give them greater say in school decisions as well as greater ability to hold the service providers accountable. Whether it leads to improved education is more debatable. In principles, schools are empowered to determine their own priorities and to develop their own school reforms to improve teaching and learning. But in practice, factors like weak management capacity, insufficient funding, ill-trained teachers and weak system support make it difficult to realize the positive potential of decentralization. The empirical research evidence on education, decentralization is mixed but frequently shows that increasing parental participation in school governance, giving teachers the right to select their own textbooks and granting school directors the authority to recruit teachers contribute positively to quality education. Our constitution also spotted this concept and made many constitutional obligations for local self-government institutions in India. In order to impart certainty, continuity, and strength to the education, 
decentralized education system have been introduced through the 73rd and 74th amendments in 1993. These amendments of the Constitution of India provided for empowerment of panchayats and nagarpalikas. The 11th schedule of constitution deals with the evolution of functions to different tiers of panchayats in respect to 29 subjects including education in primary and secondary schools. Article 243W of the Constitution of India specifies the powers, the authorities and responsibilities with respect to municipalities. Before moving forward, let's understand what is the importance of decentralization in school governance through discussing its various objectives. Its very first and foremost objective is to improve education. But how? Let me tell you, we can improve education by increasing the amount of inputs to schooling, increasing the relevance of programs, improving the quality of inputs to schooling, increasing the innovativeness of the programs, increasing the range of options available to students, reducing inequalities in access to quality education, increasing learning outcomes. Next objective is to improve the operation of education system by increasing the efficiency in allocation of resources, increasing efficiency in utilization of resources, Increasing the match of programs to employers' requirements. Increasing the use of information about issues, problems or innovations. Next important objective is to change the sources and amount of funds available for education by increasing the overall amount of money spent on education, shifting the sources of funding from one social group to another. Another objective is to give benefit to the local government by increasing revenues for education available to local government, increasing the capacity of local governments, improving the responsiveness of central government to local government requirements, redistributing political powers and weakening factors at the center in favor of those outside the center. Still another is to give benefit to the central government by relieving the central government of external political problems, relieving the central government of internal bureaucratic headaches, relieving the central government of financial burdens, increasing the political legitimacy of central government, reducing corruption at the national level. So these were the main objectives. Now moving forward, we will try to understand how decentralization is being implemented at school levels. Like other education reforms, decentralization can result in political winners and losers. The potential winners are those gaining new decision-making powers, while the potential losers are those losing powers. Two of the potential losers, civil servants and teacher unions, are sufficiently powerful that they can effectively stop decentralization processes. The civil servants working in education ministries have perhaps the most to lose because some of the jobs become useless and their power to influence the allocation of resources may be diminished. In countries where corruption in government is a serious problem, reduced power will be also reflected in a reduced ability of civil servants to extract the financial rents. The leaders of national teacher unions also lose power to the extend the salary negotiation, teacher recruitment and teacher promotion are moved from national to lower levels of government. Union members may also fear lower salaries if the funding of education is moved to local governments with fewer sources of government revenues. The implementation of education decentralization reforms can either be rapid or slow. Legislative or constitutional changes that immediately transfer responsibilities from one national to lower levels of government run the risk that lower levels of government will lack the required administrative capacity required to manage the system well. The result may be disruption in the delivery of schooling to children that adversely affects their learning at least for a time. Students. In India, there are many partners or what we say stakeholders in relation to education sector. A stakeholder is anyone who is involved in the welfare, 
and success of a school and its students, including administrators, teachers, staff, students, parents, community members, school board members, city councillors, and state representatives. Stakeholders may also be collective entities such as organizations, initiatives, committees, media outlets, and cultural institutions. They have a stake in the school and its students, which means they have personal, professional, civic, financial interest or concern in the school. The involvement of the broader community of the school can improve communication and public understanding and allows for the incorporation of the perspectives, experiences and expertise of participating community members to improve reform, proposals, strategies or processes. Parents, family and community involvement can have a different meaning for different people. These stakeholders are involved in different tasks like parenting, communicating, volunteering, learning, decision making, collaborating with community, etc. In parenting, they help families by providing them with parenting skills and family support, make them understand the phases of child development, its complexities and ways to cope with it. It also helps schools understand backgrounds and cultures of families and their goals for children. Secondly, they create a reliable communication channels between schools and home to communicate with the families about the school programs and students' progress. They also enable educators to work with volunteers who support students and the school. They involve families as volunteers and as audiences at the school. Stakeholders help in learning as they encourage the involvement of families in their child's academic learning at home through curriculum-related activities such as including homework and goal setting. They make families participants in school decisions, governance and advocacy activities. Last but not the least, they collaborate with the community, coordinate resources and services for families, students and school with community groups such as business, cultural and civic organization, colleges or universities, etc. After knowing the role of stakeholders in school education, let us know their role in local management and governance in education. The goal of any kind of activity that attempts to involve community and parents in education is to improve the educational delivery so that more children learn better and are well prepared for the changing world. The community participation and local governance contribute to achieve the goals as they help in maximizing limited resources as by involving parents, families and communities in the process of research and data collection can reveal to them factors that contribute to lower enrollment and attendance and poor academic performance in their schools. Furthermore, parents are usually concerned about the education of the children and often are willing to provide assistance that can improve the educational delivery. In places where teacher absenteeism and poor performance are critical issues, parents can be part of the system of monitoring. The supervising Teachers must ensure that teachers arrive at classroom on time and perform effectively in the classrooms. Parents and communities are powerful resources to be utilized not only in contributing to the improvement of educational delivery but also in becoming the core agent of education delivery. Secondly, they help in developing relevant curriculum and learning materials that reflects everyday lives of children in society. When children use textbooks and other materials that illustrate their own lives in their community, they can easily associate what they are learning with what they have already known. Thirdly, communities can also help to identify and address factors that contribute to educational problems such as low participation and poor academic performance. 
Furthermore, community participation can contribute in promoting girl education. Through participating in school activities and frequently communicating with the teachers, parents and communities, they can made aware that girl education will lead to the improvement of various aspects of their lives such as increased economic productivity, improved family health and nutrition, reduced fertility rates and reduced child mortality rates and many more. Involving parents and communities in discussions as part of school activities also helps to identify factors that prevent girls from schooling. Other than this, they help in realizing democracy, where schools are perceived as authoritarian institutions, parents and community members do not feel welcome to participate in the education of the child. They are not capable of taking any responsibility in school issues and tend to feel that education is something that should be taken care of by educational professionals. Many people, especially minority groups, develop this kind of negative attitude towards schools because they are not treated by teachers with respect. Involving communities in schools is a way of reaching democracy through identifying and addressing inequalities embedded in institutions and societies as whole. Another role of community and local governance is to ensure sustainability. One of the major factors to ensure sustainability of programs is the availability of funds, whether from governments, private institutions or donor organizations. In this regard, community participation in education cannot ensure the sustainability of schools by itself, since communities often times have to rely on external funding to keep the program sustained. However, involving community is a way to ensure that the benefits brought by the development program will be maintained after the external interventions are stopped. Now, Come to the role of local bodies in educational financing. Local bodies like municipalities, boards, district bodies, jilla parishads and panchayats run schools in the respective areas. They appoint the staff, provide equipment, financing to these schools through local taxes and grants from the state government. These institutions are directly under the control of local bodies. For meeting the expenditure, the school committees should receive number one, a certain proportion of the income of the local village and panchayat. Secondly, a grant in aid fixed on the basis of equalization. State grants to local bodies on account of primary education should be based on a combination of the proportional grants, a special grant for backward areas, and the specific purpose grants. It would be in the interest of education to make it obligatory on municipalities to earmark a specified proportion of their net revenue for primary education. All funds thus earmarked for primary education should be entitled to receive grant in aid according to rules. Assess on land revenue should be universally leveraged in all areas and the legislation on the subject should provide for the minimum and the maximum rates of such levy. In the village panchayats, as in the municipalities, a portion of the total revenue should be earmarked for the primary education. Now the question arises, what are the various ways through which local management and governance can contribute towards the education system or help in improving quality of education. Well, community participation and local governance can contribute in a number of ways like they help in advocating enrollment and educational benefits, boosting morale of school staff, raising money for schools, ensuring students regular attendance and completion, constructing, repairing and improving school facilities, contributing in labor, materials, lands and funds, recruiting and supporting teachers, making decisions about school locations and schedules, 
monitoring and following up on teacher attendance and performance, forming village education committees to manage schools, actively attending school meetings to learn about children's learning progress and classroom behavior, providing skill instruction and local culture information, helping children with the studying, garnering more resources and solving problems through the education bureaucracy, advocating and promoting girl education, scheduling school calendars, handling the budget to operate schools, identifying factors contributing to educational problems, providing security for teachers by preparing adequate housing for them, preparing children ready for schooling by providing them with adequate nutrition and stimuli for their cognitive development. Now let us discuss the main advantages of local governance in education. Number one, the local self-government solves the problems of rural people at the grassroots level. This strengthens the democracy. The typical needs of a particular village are well attended by this system of government. The state government remains so much busy with the multifarious functions that it seldom gets time to attend to the basic problems of different rural areas. The local government reduces the burden of responsibility of the state government to the large extent. Number two, it performs various functions which are vital for making life of the local people happier and prosperous. The various needs of the rural areas such as construction and maintenance of roads, availability of water, construction of schools, education facilities, improving in agriculture, etc. are taken care of the local self-government. Moreover, it encourages local leadership. The problem of particular rural area can be best attended by the members of the panchayats. The state or national government cannot do so because of so many reasons. Therefore, the problems of local people are solved by local leaders through the institution of local self-government. The real improvement in the social and economic conditions of people can happen only through the intentional participation in the developmental plans and programs. Local governance acts as a training ground for citizenship. The local people are motivated to confront and solve their problems of their own. They become less dependent upon other external agencies. It creates confidence among the local leaders at the grassroots level. These leaders put their best foot forward. Many local leaders advances their career to become state level and national level politicians. Other than this, it helps in new experiments. New infrastructural and developmental projects can be first implemented at local level to gauge its impact on the system. Successful projects can later be introduced in other areas of local governments. The next is challenges faced by local government. The system of local self-government is not completely without any defect or drawback. There are many challenges in front of local self-government, like regionalism. Sometimes it is criticized on the ground that it incites regionalism. The local leaders get so much entangled in the solution of their own problem that they hardly able to see things beyond their nose and join the national mainstream. Secondly, some critics remark that the leaders at the local level fail to appreciate the state or national problems in their real perspective because of the very difference in the nature and scope. Then there is local elitism, which is a major problem. Sometimes resources for development can be captured by local elites and used primarily for their own benefits rather than of intended beneficiaries. Next is decreasing interest of community members. It is also a big threat in the way of decentralization. Individual or community management of education has been a cultural phenomena in India from ancient period to present time, but it is reversing when it is formally assigned to the community. Next challenge is illiteracy and low educational level. Illiteracy and low educational level have 
cumulative impact on the actualization of the decentralization, illiteracy bars the flow of information to the some definite section of the community and makes them unaware about their roles, rights and responsibilities. Another is lack of interest on the part of political leaders and bureaucrats. These groups are never try seriously to include all sections of the society in the management of the education. Some socially and economically deprived groups dare not to raise their voices and communicate their educational needs. Last but not the least, there is dearth of human resources fit for the work, which is also a major problem. Education sector is deprived of the administrative leaders who have first-hand experience of the system as well as interest to improve the system. It needs a self-motivated personnel who can realize the existing policies like decentralized management and can conceive innovative plans and strategies to implement them. Well, at the end, we can conclude, community participation itself is not a goal in education delivery not a solution to solve complicated issues contributing to poor educational quality in both developing and developed countries. It is a process that facilitates the realization of improving educational quality and the promotion of democracy with society. Political leaders and bureaucrats used to maintain secrecy regarding public rights and their roles in the systems. The need of the R is to involve communities in various stages, that is, while preparation, implementation and evaluation. Communities are also expected to develop and strengthen these capacities so that they can contribute to more in the governance and the management of education. In the sense, the state job is to facilitate the process, providing communities with the necessary knowledge and skills, and making sure Communication takes place effectively among different stakeholders, including parents, community members, the teachers and government officials. As the recognition of community participation increases, careful examination of its exercises becomes more important. Thank you.